After 500 years of dealing with race in this country, why is everything about race? Because white people created everything to be about race. The irony of it is that a lot of people who have read the title, who are white, think that the reason why it's called that is because I am asking black people to stop talking about race. And that's actually not what the point of the book is. In Why Does Everything Have to Be About Race? 25 Arguments That Won't Go Away, author Keith Boykin draws from the complex history of America, from its constitutional roots, the Civil War, segregation, and to the halting progress toward racial equality to argue that race is not just an important topic of discussion, but a fundamental aspect of the nation's fabric. A lot of people don't see race as a factor in their own lives, and therefore they assume it's not a factor. Because we had a black president, and there's a black guy who works as a waiter at my country club now. <laughs> so we can't be racist. <laughs> the Civil War was not about states' rights. It was about slavery. And there's a lot of people out there who have trouble saying that. Through his work, Boykin demonstrates how to confront and correct falsehoods, myths, and misrepresentations with historical accuracy, informed understanding, and the power of truth. This book is written for those weary of having to justify the importance of these discussions, for individuals looking for ways to engage in and navigate these conversations, and for anyone open to understanding the profound impact of race on individuals and society at large. I'm optimistic that some people can be persuaded, but I'm also optimistic that we are the majority and that the vocal minority who do hold racist beliefs and seem to be less apologetic about that, even though they're getting louder and more aggressive, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're becoming more numerous, but it does mean in some ways that they're becoming more desperate. And that can be just as dangerous. Born in St. Louis, Missouri, and educated at Dartmouth College and Harvard Law School, Boykin served in the White House as a special assistant to President Bill Clinton. He's also made his mark as a television commentator and academic. Boykin has also authored several influential books on race and sexuality, such as One More River to Cross and For Colored Boys Who Have Considered Suicide When the Rainbow Is Still Not Enough. His contributions have been significant to the nation's understanding of these critical issues. The function of racism is distraction. The whole point of it is to keep us engaged in answering somebody else's questions so we don't have time to do our own work. And so I wanted to have a book for myself, which would be a handy reference guide, but also as a way to prevent people from getting distracted. Today, our guest is Keith Boykin, author of the book, Why Does Everything Have to Be About Race? Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Well, I'm going to ask a very basic question. It's the question that's actually the title of your book. Why do you think everything does have to do with race, and to whom did you actually write this book? It's a question that I didn't really make my own, but rather that I hear a lot from other people. Particularly white Americans are frequently asking black Americans, why do we talk about race so much? Why is this an issue that is always on our minds? And the exact impetus for the book is that I was giving a Black History Month speech a few years ago when a student after my speech got up and essentially asked, why are you talking about race? Why is this an issue that you're discussing? And I was thinking, this is a Black History Month speech. Why wouldn't I talk about race? But it's a reflection, I think, of just how our society was built on race from the very beginning, created a constitution that defined Black people as only three-fifths of a human, and then proceeded to ignore the Declaration of Independence, the idea that all men are created equal, and fought a civil war over the issue of race followed by another hundred years of segregation, and only in my lifetime has started to move out or away from that with very halting efforts to address those centuries of racism. And so after all that, after 500 years of dealing with race in this country, why isn't everything about race? Because white people created everything to be about race. And why do you think that question gets asked? You know, why is everything 
racism, and people might tend to think, and people that I've interviewed and talked to, have said that, well, if we didn't talk about it, then it would just go away and it wouldn't be a problem. Well, I think the question gets asked for two reasons. One, because there are a group of people who don't want us to talk about race. And so by positioning this question out there, it bullies people into not discussing it or tries to bully people into not discussing it. The second reason is a little less nefarious, and that is because a lot of people don't see race. Not that literally they don't see race, but they don't see race as a factor in their own lives. And therefore, they assume it's not a factor because they see, hey, we had a black president. And there's a black guy who works as a waiter in my country club now. <laughs> so we can't be racist. And that is a very simplistic way of seeing the world through one's own eyes without seeing how one's own perspective has an impact on everybody else. So if you're right handed as 90% of Americans or people are, or humans are, and you walk around thinking, there's no problem for left-handed people. It's okay that we only make one kind of scissors. It's okay that everything is, is catered toward people who are right-handed. You forget that there are other people out there who see the world differently and experience the world differently, and there needs to be some sort of accommodation or adjustment or acknowledgement of their experience. I really like the right and left-handed argument that you kind of put out there because my sister was left-handed. Are you left-handed? I am not, but you know, I literally just thought about this yesterday or the day before, and I, I was like, you know what, this, this kind of, I was trying to figure out a way to describe it, and that was like the best example that came to mind, and I was like, well, I'm going to use it, this is the first time I ever said it. The first time you said that, that, that even set a click off to me, because I'm well aware with the arguments that you have in the book, and I think a lot of it is relatability. People might not have to do with race. If you are white in this country, you might not have to deal with it on a daily basis, mm -hmm. but if you bring that question kind of home, to something that you can relate it to, then you might actually be willing to entertain the question and ask yourself why you're asking that question. Because having grown up with a sister who's left-handed and even our position sitting at the dinner table, we had to have our sides or else we just bump elbows the entire time. That kind of triggered me and I didn't need to ask about why everything had to be about race. So I think that's another good way um, to kind of approach it. Well, thank you for that suggestion. Now that I've heard you say that, I'm going to continue to use that. <laughs> There's an interesting way that you've gone about actually presenting um, this question in the book. You've done it in the form of 25 different questions, and you've kind of broken down the questions into different parts. Who did you write this book for, and how did you decide to break down the book in the way that you did? I wrote the book for myself because I spent five years working for CNN covering the Trump administration from January 2017 until December 31st, 2021. So every day I was waking up, reading six, seven, eight newspapers a day, checking the Donald Trump's Twitter feed, engaging with a lot of conservative people who did not believe that racism was a problem in our country. Despite everything that was happening, despite the five and a half years that of birtherism that Trump helped to perpetuate, despite the comments about Charlottesville, despite the attacks on Colin Kaepernick, despite the attacks on John Lewis, despite all the rising indicators of racism in America, that people were still denying its existence or denying that politics was having any impact on that. And it felt like a lot of gaslighting. Like, I couldn't believe that smart people could honestly ignore what was happening and what is still happening in our country. So let's talk about how you did actually lay it out. You, you have certain questions, you have 25 that you ask and then answer inside each little section of the book. And the book is divided into five parts. And the, the five parts represent the five main ways in which white supremacy perpetuates itself. But one of those ways is by erasing black history, by denying its existence or its relevance. And so there are several chapters within that book one of those, which is surprisingly relevant today, is that the Civil War was not about states' rights, it was about slavery. And that was something that happened 160 years ago. So this is a part of the erasure of our history by denying that slavery was the cause of it. It allows our society to pretend that we didn't really have this problem that divided the country and caused 600,000 people to be killed. That it was just a fight over states' rights and 
all these other things and the freedom and all those kinds of gen generic terms that don't really deal with the reality that black people were treated as property in this country. And that was legal, authorized by our federal and state governments and society at large. And we still, even after a, de a century and a half, have yet to fully reconcile our debt because of that. So, yes, it's states' rights, and even I would argue, yes, it was about states' rights, but states' rights to do what? To hold black people as slaves. So it was about the states' rights to do that, and that was even explicitly written in the constitutions of a lot of the southern states, and especially South Carolina, the place where the Civil War was started, and when the, it was explicitly written in the constitution there. How do you think that someone is going to answer the the response that you actually have to that question in the book because it's a it's a strong question and these are irrefutable facts they were written down i always tell people there are three groups of people one are the people who are invested in not believing anything you say one are the people who will agree with almost everything you say because they're your allies or they're the choir, if you will, that we often preach to. And the, another, the third group, are the people who are persuadable. Don't necessarily fit in one camp or the other. I'm not interested in talking to the first group of people who are not interested in talking to me or not interested in hearing the truth or not interested in learning or having a serious dialogue. I think that's an unproductive use of our time and resources and so I'm more interested in talking to people who either share my viewpoint but don't necessarily have the facts and data to prove it, or people who are persuadable and just don't really have any sort of opinion one way or the other, but are open to reasonable argument. Uh, and so I don't really spend much time with the other people. I had to when I was on CNN for five years, but... I don't think they believe what they're saying either. I think a lot of them feel like they have to say this because they are appealing to a base of people in their party that holds on to these views. And it used to be that that base was discredited, denied, denounced, unacknowledged, but now they've become louder and more vocal and they've become the representative of the party, not the outlier of that party. They're the louder part of what's going on with the party, but do you think that they are a louder part of the nation as a whole? I think that they've always been there, and they will always continue to be there unless we have a dramatic change in our society. But I don't think it's party-specific. You know, I get a lot of people who say to me, because I'm a lifelong Democrat, I don't apologize or deny that, but... A lot of people say to me, well, you know, the Republicans were the party of Lincoln and they freed the slaves and the Democrats, the party of slavery and segregation. And I hear that. I understand that. Not entirely accurate, but there is a lot of accuracy to that. And I ask them if they think that history stopped in 1963, because that's pretty much when the party started to change, when Lyndon Johnson made the push for the Civil Rights Act after JFK was assassinated and signed the Civil Rights Act of 64, the Voting Rights Act of 65, the Fair Housing Act of 1968, and appointed Thurgood Marshall to the Supreme Court. When the Democratic Party moved on to select the first black chair of any political party, Ron Brown, to select the first black president of the United States, Barack Obama, or the first black vice president of the United States, Kamala Harris. And I think what people miss is that it's not about Democrats or Republicans, because I think for a long time, both parties were blatantly, openly racist. The period of Reconstruction, for which Republicans love to take credit and, and for which they're famous, was only about 12 years after the Civil War, from 1865 to 1877. And then Republicans brokered a deal with Democrats, with the racist Democrats at the time, in order to stay in power. So we have another... 90 years or so, where both parties are pretty much openly racist, Republicans and Democrats, and they're not really making a serious effort to appeal to black voters. The reality is that white America, since Lyndon Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act in 1964, Lyndon Johnson was a Democrat, no 
Democratic candidate for president has won the white vote. Why do we think that is? You think white people just suddenly decided that, oh, we're going to vote for Republicans because Republicans are more interested in helping black people. Of course not. They voted for Republicans because they felt like Republicans at that point were making a shift to be more representative of their own interest. Are you optimistic that things can actually change once certain questions are addressed and people who are persuadable can be persuaded? I'm optimistic that some people can be persuaded, but I'm also optimistic that we are the majority um, and that the vocal minority of people who are who do hold racist beliefs and seem to be less apologetic about that, even though they're getting louder and more aggressive, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're becoming more numerous, but it does mean in some ways that they're becoming more desperate. And that can be just as dangerous. If you look at the, the uh, political races, for example, because I tend to see things through politics as a political actor, Democrats have won the popular vote in seven of the last eight presidential elections. And Democrats have become a very diverse political party, whereas the Republican Party has become more representative of white voters, and they've lost seven of the last eight presidential elections in the popular vote. That's a concern for them, as is the fact that by 2044, according to the Census Bureau, white people will no longer be the majority of the population. That's a huge concern for a lot of white people. I feel like the demographic numbers and the, and the trends in young people in some ways help to move things in a positive direction toward change, and that gives me some cause for optimism. But on the other hand, I also realize that with every mo moment of progress in our country, there's been a history of backlash in, in response. And so... The fact that we elected a black president led to the Tea Party and Donald Trump becoming president. The fact that we had a, a civil rights movement in the, in the 50s and 60s led to the Southern strategy and, and Nixon and Reagan era of the 70s and 80s. Uh, the fact that we had a civil war and reconstruction 150, 60 years ago led to the period of Jim Crow segregation that followed it. There's a long history that whenever black people make progress, uh, black people end up for a short period of time benefiting, but then in the long run, having to fight for those basic rights. And I feel like we are in that period now where we're going to have to fight for our basic rights. I'm hopeful and optimistic as long as people understand the threat that we face and are willing to meet the challenge at hand. How do you see the different approach that needs to take place so that maybe some sort of apology, <laughs> let alone reparations, which you call for in your book, can actually be addressed? We can't just assume that time inevitably will make things better. We have to be actively engaged in protecting those rights. And we're seeing that movement backwards. If you can't do affirmative action anymore, according to the Supreme Court, because that's somehow discriminatory. Uh, if you can't do uh, DEI anymore, because they're attacking that, the idea of diversity is now problematic, according to them, then that becomes an issue. Uh, and if you can't even have a Voting Rights Act anymore, uh, because they've gutted that, going, starting back with 2013 in the Shelby County v. Holder case, if you can't do any of those basic things, then how are you going to make this, this long reach to get to reparations? Um, it doesn't mean reparations is, is any less important and necessary. In fact, it, it, it argues in my mind that it's, it's more necessary, more critical, more urgent than ever. And part of the reason why is because unlike some societies and some countries, we never really had that moment of atonement, that moment of, of reconciliation. In South Africa, an example I often like to mention, after apartheid ended, they, they created a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. They went back and looked at what took place over the course of apartheid and how this happened and who was responsible not necessarily for the purpose of blaming and hating people, but for the purpose of understanding how do we prevent this from happening again? We didn't do that. To the extent that we tried, it was quickly reversed. In 1863, when President Lincoln signed the District of Columbia Compensated Emancipation Act, which freed slaves in, the, in Washington, D.C., they provided reparations to white people who were the enslavers. 
because they felt that the only way they could take away the quote unquote property of these people legally and constitutionally was to give them money to do so because the Fifth Amendment to the Constitution says and the Due Process Clause says you can't take property without just compensation. But the black people who were the property, quote unquote, the people who gave their time and labor and lives unwillingly for the sake of building this country were never compensated. And then two years later, when the war actually ends, General William Tecumseh Sherman conducts his march to the sea from Atlanta to Savannah and burns down the Confederate cities along the way and takes over and gives huge parcels of land to black people all throughout the Carolinas and Georgia along the coast and the Atlantic coast. He promises 40 acres in this field order number 15, this 40 acres, and later uh, the offer of a, a mule to be leased. That's, that's where we get the expression 40 acres and a mule. When thousands of black people start to settle on the land that was given to them by the federal government through the action of the military by General Sherman in 1865. And then President Andrew Johnson comes in office after Lincoln's assassination and repeals it all, rescinds the order, revokes the, the land that was given to these black people and gives it back to the white people who were the enslavers who fought against the government, fought against our country, rewards them for their infidelity. So this is all very problematic and, it, and it's a reflection of why we have, we have to create some enormous structural change in order to get ourselves out of the situation we're in. Dr. King supported what he called preferential treatment or compensatory treatment, a massive program to do that. A lot of people don't know that because they think that Dr. King just gave one speech in one moment on August 28, 1963, and talked about his four kids playing kickball with white kids. But that wasn't his vision. It was a revolutionary vision for equality, not just equality of opportunity that cannot exist without a fair playing field, but equality of results in the sense that everyone has an equal, a full and real equal opportunity to, to reach those results. But it's almost impossible in this country when we have socioeconomic disparities that are correlated with race. Do you have anything in particular that you, Keith Boykin, are calling for? I don't think of reparations as a check, but as a change. I think it's a comprehensive program or set of programs to figure out how do we understand what took place, first of all. That's part of reparations, understanding what took place. And then secondly, how do we balance those scales? We know, for example, in employment, that black unemployment has never been as low as white unemployment. In fact, it's almost always been twice as high as white unemployment. How do we eliminate that disparity? We know, for example, in health outcomes, that black people are more likely to die at an early age. We have lower life expectancies. We have more health problems and more mortality issues. How do we rectify those problems? Does that mean we have to have more access to doctors, more hospitals in our communities? What is involved with that? So how do we eliminate those disparities is the first step. And then the second thing that I think is important is that there needs to be reparations to find our history. When I did genealogy studies in my family, I couldn't go back past 1865 or 1870 to find out who were the people before that because they were enslaved. And those records are very difficult to find. I think the government owes us, since the government helped to create and the society helped to create this, this problem where they destroyed our families, destroyed those records, they owe us an obligation to help, to help us find those records and put those back together. You grew up, for part of your youth, for a good chunk of your youth, right here in St. Louis. Do you think it impacted the way that you view race later on in your life? If so, how and how deeply and does it still affect the way that you, you see it today? I'm sure it did in many ways. I mean, I was born in St. Louis at Homer G. Phillips Hospital, which was at that time still a racially segregated hospital in North St. Louis. I lived in North St. Louis as an infant, and then my family moved to Florissant, Missouri, which at that time was a mostly white or nearly all white community, no longer is. That also is a reflection of society, too, the whole white flight that takes place whenever black people, a critical mass, whatever that means, of black people move into a neighborhood, the white people don't like it anymore, and they move out to find another area to get away from us. And 
I think all those things obviously had an impact on me, but I saw people and had friends with people who were of various races, who were black and white, who were Latino and Asian American. And I don't think I knew many people who were indigenous when I was in St. Louis or Native American, but I have since encountered them. But St. Louis was St. Louis was a unique place, and I didn't really fully appreciate that until after I left and I started to live in other places. I realized what made it so unique. I've never seen another city, to my knowledge, that I've been involved with, where which had so many private streets. For example, if you look at the area in the Central West End uh, and all the private streets by Forest Park and the Chase Park Plaza Hotel, that's a fascinating concept to see that in in inner city environment, not in a suburb somewhere, but these private streets. And just the, the, the sense of, of the ways in which segregation tells people in their minds where they can and cannot go. You know, Carter G. Woodson, the, the famous Black historian, the one who created the concept of Negro History Week, which became later Black History Month. Carter G. Woodson, in his book, The Miseducation of the Negro, said that if you control a man's thinking, you don't have to control his actions. And I think there's a lot of mental conditioning that takes place in cities like St. Louis that helps to control where we feel like we are and are not welcome. I remember once years ago when I was a, a child or a teenager, I wanted to go to the VP fair in, in uh, downtown St. Louis uh, under the arch. And my aunt, who I mentioned this to, told me, I remember this like, uh, just very, very vividly, vividly to this day. She said, them white people ain't going to let you go down there. I was like, wow, I never thought about that because I was living in the suburbs or surrounded by white people. And I never, and she was living in inner city st at that time and never occurred to me that there was a place that couldn't go. And it was a little reflection of just how that history uh, had, had an intergenerational trauma, the trauma of racism that she experienced that she passed on to her children and to me, even as her nephew. In order for us to recover from that trauma, we have to make a serious effort to understand that we were experiencing it and what we should do about it. And the last question, what do you hope for in the future? Hope that people have a chance to, to see what I've seen in my life. Because I've lived in 12 different cities across the world. And when you have that experience, I don't mean that you have to live in another city, another city or leave the country in order to do this. But when you have the experience of, of seeing beyond your own block, your own community. It does help you, I think, if you are open-minded and conscious. It does help you to gain perspective that the way things are is not necessarily the way things have to be. Uh, and so part of it is I hope that people's, people will begin to embrace more of an abundance mentality instead of a scarcity mentality, an abundance mentality that allows us to recognize that there are plentiful resources in the universe that we can take advantage of. And we don't have to be engaged in this competitive zero-sum game all the time of trying to fight for the scarce resources because if, if this black person gets something, then I'm not going to get something. If this immigrant comes in the country, then I'm not going to get a job. If this LGBTQ person has the right to be treated equally, then somehow that affects my, my security. Or if, if this woman has the right to control her body, then what does that say about my sense of patriarchy? I mean, at, at some point, we have to understand how all these these conventions and norms that have limited our minds are oppressing all of us, not just the the, the direct victims, but they're oppressing even the so-called beneficiaries, the, the the oppressor class, because they have to live in live in these rigid guidelines that are artificially constructed that don't adequately and accurately represent who we are as a human species. Keith Boykin author of the book, Why Does Everything Have to Be About Race? Thank you very much for joining us today and uh, virtually coming back to the city of St. Louis. <laughs> Thank you for having me virtually back in the city of St. Louis. <laughs>